Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to this, the um, second official day of International Education Week. Here at MSU, we've already had a few events taking place. We had an international gala on Friday night, and then we had our um, large and really exciting um, global festival here in the International Center on Saturday, and then events kicked off yesterday officially. Um, and so today we are really pleased to have this distinguished faculty panel. A little bit of a background on International Education Week. It's an initiative of the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Department of Education that annually celebrates the benefits of international education and exchange worldwide. MSU recognizes the high value of international engagement and its essential role in MSU's mission to advance knowledge and transform lives. MSU's celebration of International Education Week will showcase campus programs, activities, and pedagogies that prepare MSU students for global environments and attract future leaders from abroad to study, learn, and exchange experiences right here on our campus. My name is Opal Lehman Bargis. I'm the Executive Director of Education Abroad at MSU. I'm also the Interim Director of the Global Youth Advancement Network. Really pleased to be here with you today, and I want to thank you for joining us. We have invited uh, three faculty members from across the campus to share their thoughts on what makes for a meaningful international institutional partnership. So here was the prompt that we gave to our three panelists and then asked them to take this conversation in any way that they would like. Beyond traditional thoughts of institutional partnerships as essentially exchange agreements for the mobility of students, which is very important, of course, what makes for a simultaneously strategic, dynamic, and respectful international partnership? Panelists will aim to explore this question and more, such as, what underlying principles should guide the careful development of institutional partnerships? What benefits are there to partnerships that may involve the mobility of faculty, joint research, online international dialogue, or collaborations in additional areas, especially those involving unexpected teams and innovative purposes? What may be missed when institutional partnerships are ent entered into without thoughtful consideration of the potential impacts and opportunities of collaborators? How can we apply an, enga an engaged global lens to the perhaps mundane but important administrative realities of partnership development and maintenance? Rollicked by a pandemic that at times seemed to threaten to dissolve some international institutional partnerships, might we adjust our thinking about these collaborations to prioritize sustainability, and ensure alignment with long-term strategic goals. We don't expect each of our panelists to address all of this within their 10 to 15 minutes each, um, but we have asked them again to take this conversation in any direction that they would like. And so um, I will now turn it over to our first presenter, um, Stephen Esquith, and Stephen will allow you to um, introduce yourself in detail, but Stephen is Professor of Philosophy and Founding Dean of the Residential College in the Arts and Humanities, He's now situated in our College of Arts and Letters. Following Steve, we'll have Carl Bollert, Professor of Engineering, and then Julie Sinclair, Associate Director in International Studies in Education in our College of Education. So first up, Steve. Hi, everyone. So what I'm going to do, since I've got 15 minutes, is uh, zoom through uh, 20 years of what I've been doing with international partnerships and then spend the majority of my time on two of the uh, six, I think, prompts that Opal just went through, uh, two that are most relevant to the work I've done and my own background. So I'm gonna talk about principles and administrative headaches or challenges. Uh, so I'm gonna just take two out of the six and spend some time and maybe uh, raise some questions. These are the two that I'm gonna talk about. What underlying principles should guide the careful uh, development of institutional partnerships and how can we apply an engaged global lens to the perhaps mundane but important administrative realities of partnership development and maintenance. So I'll just ask you to hold on, that's where we're headed. Um, my work uh, in international partnering uh, has been in Mali mostly, though not exclusively in Mali. And it started in 2002, and it's run for two decades. Um, this list will give you an idea of who the partners are. There have been eight major partners, and then others have come and gone. 
uh, but these include uh, Malian NGOs, uh, international NGOs, a organization that does uh, uh, scientific uh, animation without borders, SABO that was at MSU, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Mali, University in Mali, and currently our primary partner, which is the uh, uh, government's camps for internally displaced persons uh, in Mali, where the civil war has been sort of heating up and cooling down a bit from time to time since uh, 2018. Um, these are the things that we've been doing. I started out for 10 years doing a uh, doing research and running a study abroad program in Mali on a general topic of ethics and development. Uh, then with the uh, coup in 2012, 2013, we focused on peace, uh, peace and justice and peace building and developed uh, four primary initiatives. One, a political simulation, Jeu de la Paix Malienne, a Malian peace game uh, for picture books that we developed with our partners. Uh, on some of the challenges of life in a uh, difficult, in difficult circumstances. We turned several of those into video animations and also several of the testimonies that were given to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Mali, which we used in local venues, uh, these video animations. And currently we're doing a photo voice project uh, in the uh, camps for internally displaced persons. This is a picture, so a little evidence to prove that what I just said actually happened, at least there are pictures of it. Um, this is the political simulation game that we began in uh, 2012 in the, the town of Kati, which is where the actual coup of 20, uh, 2012 began. Uh, this is a picture of, if I can make it go, oops, I think I jumped the slide. This is a page from a a trilingual picture book that we developed with our teachers and students in the Chihuahua School dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder uh, and its effects on families in uh, uh, in Mali. This is a, a slide or a still from the video animation on kidnapping that uh, occurred uh, and was uh, the subject of much testimony before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that we brought to uh, local audiences. And this is a picture of one of our uh, consultants from a photo studio uh, in Mali, Yamaru Photo Studio, working with young uh, men and uh, girl, uh, boys and girls uh, on the use of photo voice, which is a tool for uh, helping uh, people in post-conflict situations, or uh, sometimes it's not that post. Uh, describe the work that they, uh, the life that they live. And this is a picture of that reflection session in one of the camps, uh, the Mabile camp in Bamako in Mali uh, from 2021. So that's, uh, that's the story. That's what I've been doing for 20 years in Mali. And now some reflections to get you sort of, get you thinking about the meaningfulness of the work and what are some of the bumps in the road and challenges. So first question, what underlying principles should guide the careful development of institutional partnerships? Uh, Opal kind of blew my cover. I'm a philosopher by trade. And so of course I had to find some principles uh, that uh, we could uh, pick apart and you know see if, how well they apply. One is the principle of security. And so what, uh, I was regularly reminded of was that there are unequal security risks between you as a you know member of the MSU community doing international work and the partners that you work with. Sometimes those uh, security risks are fairly simple, uh, but sometimes they uh, can be extremely um, important. Uh, your your safety is uh, is important, uh, but it's not always easy to guarantee the safety of your partners when they're working with you in a conflict situation. Uh, Médecin Sans Frontières has sort of dramatized some of the, uh, the inequality and in security risks in some of the writing by uh, people who've worked for them. Uh, this particular example didn't occur to me exactly the same 
the way that it occurred in some of the uh, situations that Made Sans Sans Frontières has encountered. Uh, but just to give you an idea of what I mean, if there's a kidnapping and there were times when I had to have security uh, with me as I traveled in different parts of Mali, if there is a kidnapping, you as a uh, an American hostage are actually in a much different security situation than your uh, local partner, uh, because you may actually be uh, someone they can barter with or bargain with, whereas the uh, the partner is more expendable, and the partners know that. Uh, so that's a, a extreme case, but there are you know different cases that are not quite as extreme. Principle of proper use of language. And since I'm um, talking about Médecins Sans Frontières uh, and the work they've done on post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma in general, uh, in a situation where you have multiple languages, and I was working in French, Bamanacan, and English, uh, not often in English, but mostly in French and Bamanacan, uh, the use of language, especially medical language, can be a fairly complex and uh, um, important thing to keep in mind that what you mean by trauma may not be what your partners mean by trauma. Sometimes the uh, use of languages that's medical language that apply in individual cases can't be easily applied in, uh, to a collective and you, one need, you need to be careful not to uh, uh, jump to conclusions that the trauma of an individual results in the trauma of a village, for example. Principle of commitment, commit to the long haul, but don't overpromise, right? That, that uh, That's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, I think the partners want to know that you're coming back, but they uh, don't uh, want to hear from you that you're going to promise them the world and then uh, create unreasonable expectations that disappoint them. Uh, principle of reciprocity, strive for radical reciprocity, not just taking turns. For them, reciprocity doesn't mean you know, to use the baseball analogy, uh, you go to bat and then play in the field while they go to bat and sort of rotate back and forth. Reciprocity has to address the uh, differences in uh, resource inequality so that, uh, you know, uh, so that people are, aren't, uh, I think, uh, unhappy about what you mean by reciprocity. Finally, a principle of local customs. Now, this may seem um, obvious, but it turns out to be very important with partners, especially uh, where the uh, the language is not English. Uh, greetings, uh, traditional greetings, uh, taking time to greet, taking time to ask people about their family situations, their children, their parents, all those things may seem like they're getting in the way of getting the work done. They're actually necessary for getting the work done. Um, I think I've got about two or three more minutes, if, if my watch is correct. So let me go to the last uh, one, where how can we apply an engaged global lens to the perhaps mundane but important administrative realities of partnership development and maintenance? Uh, administrative realities, to keep in mind, that are very important, uh, beyond simply the functioning of the ongoing project. Uh, this also has to do with inequality, global inequality in healthcare. What you assume is going to be, you know, the quality of healthcare if you have to go to a local clinic. For I was in Mali during the Ebola crisis in uh, in neighboring countries that came into Mali. Uh, exactly where I was located in Mali, and we had to go to a local clinic. Uh, uh, for sort of preventive care and instruction, um, the uh, the risks of that uh, pandemic were very different for me uh, with the kind of health care that I had and the evacuation uh, provisions in my health care that I had uh, compared to what my partners had, and that created a certain amount of sort of complexity in the uh, in the way in which we could work travel restrictions and costs. Sometimes partnerships involve uh, travel back to the US or travel to a neutral site uh, in another country in the global north, uh, but uh, there are travel restrictions uh, for your partners and you uh, may not be able to overcome them. So being careful about where you schedule those 
meetings on neutral uh, on a neutral court or in a you know third uh, location uh, it may also cost them much more in terms of their relative uh, you know annual income and uh, so one needs to be careful in terms of scheduling meetings uh, uh, that uh, involve travel and that includes in-country travel as well you can be you know working in a village and then you tr you schedule another meeting in a capital city uh, and you assume well everybody can get to the capital city but in fact it may uh, may be a very uh, difficult thing for someone in our more remote village to arrange finally and this is my last point um, employment so while the uh, you know the partnership is you know intrinsically a good thing and it's work and you're getting things done and people have uh, are able to uh, um, sort of uh, think about how this will lead to further employment. Um, oftentimes, uh, partners will want uh, recommendations. Uh, the French word in Mali is attestation. Uh, and you may think, well, this isn't you know, really necessary. There's no job application here. They're just collecting something for their you know, files. But in fact, it is an important part of the work they're doing to gather such uh, sort of testimonials. And so take, good, take time to write those testimonials, those attestations. Uh, they matter quite a bit for young people in the partnerships uh, who are looking to move beyond the uh, the particular project you're working on. And I think I'm one minute ahead of schedule. So there'll be time for Q&A later, I assume, correct? That's right. Okay. Great, great okay. job on the timing. Thank you for all of that very much, Steve. Um, as you said, we will have our three presenters um, going one after the other, and then we'll save time for Q&A at the end. I want to be sure that we have time to get everyone in here. So um, next up is... Carl Bullard, Professor of Engineering. Carl, I'll turn it over to you. So Steve, thank you very much for doing what you said. And I will, <clears throat> I was trying to highlight all of them if I could, but I won't have to go over some of them that you went through. So I'll introduce myself as well. I'm a professor in chemical engineering and material science in the College of Engineering at Michigan State. I've been here since 2005. And shortly after I came, we started to establish some international um, contacts. And what we have is two student exchange programs between the Polytechnic University of Madrid and the Pontificat of Madrid Comillas. They're both um, engineering technical universities mainly. Um, we've had it for over 10 years now where we have a the students go uh, on a, a, not a faculty led program, but it's just an exchange program. And we've had over 30, some of our students go to Polytechnic University of Madrid and had some uh, of some 30 come here as well. So we have an even balance. And for Comillas, um, we're now going to get overbalanced more on our side starting next spring. We're going to have a total of seven or I think I think it's nine on our side and about six on their side. So that one started a little bit later, but it's gaining more mo momentum. And we also run a faculty-led uh, summer engineering in Madrid program where I go over there as well as other faculty and we teach for a period of six weeks in Madrid to our students, but they, they also take, our students also take a um, Spanish class taught by the Polytechnic University of Madrid people. And we've had well over 120 students participate in that. And one thing about all the students that I can unequivocally say is they really love their experience. It's hard to, do, no matter how much we try to blow it, Madrid is really overcomes everything because it's such a wonderful place to be. We have a joint PhD agreement with the IIT Madras in India and MSU, where students go like exchange program, graduate students, and they're two years in Madras, two years at Michigan State, and they get a degree um, in our, from the College of Engineering and our engineering program, um, from both of these universities. And lastly, we were lucky enough, what I think by building up these programs to write a strong proposal to NSF for an international research experience for students grants. We're in the middle of it right now. And we have we go in the summer for seven or more weeks where students work full-time 40 hours a week 
Um, right now it's seven weeks, but it could go up to 14 weeks. And they work at an institute called the Madrid Institute of Advanced Studies and Materials in Bay of Materials. And some of the faculty that are at UPM, Polytechnic University of Madrid, also work at Andea Materials. And so there's a connection between the two. And this program is just students get paid. They get paid for all the housing, they get paid for their uh, flights, their living expenses, their per diem, their food. And they also get paid for doing research there all through NSF grant. And so it's really important. All, all aspects of these deal with the questions that are being posed by this um, uh, hour long uh, discussion that we're having. And so the key thing at the bottom here is we have regular communication, regular visits between leaders of each of the programs back and forth from um, Europe or India to the Michigan State. And that's one of the really important aspects of our agreements and our the, the success of our programs. If we don't have this good communication, then everything is going to falter. So now I'm going to try to move it to the next one, which makes, oops, I think I just moved it too much. I want to go to. Yeah. So Steve talked about this one. What are the underlying principles that should guide careful development of institutional partnerships? And Steve hit it very well. I'm not I don't think I'm even going to repeat anything. I mean, I couldn't say much more than he can, but I'd just say what I put down was openness to different cultures and different way of doing things. Madrid certainly has a different culture than what we have in the United States and Michigan and uh, Madras in India also has a different culture. So openness to that, to experience what other people's perspective is, um, is a really, really big deal to um, help develop our institutional partnerships and recognizing these differences and discussing them openly and being open to them, meaning not to be critical. And second thing is similarities in mission between institutions. Um, in order to have these agreements set up, there has to be some similarities in mission and how we teach. For example, in the student exchange programs, most of the students are going into material science and engineering or mechanical engineering disciplines. And they're taking classes in those. And therefore, the mission has to be to develop or is to develop engineers to enhance our future and to teach them fundamentals of their disciplines. And so we both have that at all the institutions that we've had collaborations with. We want to develop students who are our future. We want to educate them well, and we want to um, give them good experiences so they can build upon them, both in research and in education and, and, and in classroom. So one of the questions that uh, Steve didn't answer that I don't think he addressed was what benefits are there to partnerships that may involve the mobility of faculty, joint research, online and intercultural dialogue or collaborations in additional areas, especially those involved in unexpected teams and innovative processes? Well, to highlight the second thing down here, we usually have unexpected teams of students and researchers working together because each year we don't know who we're going to get. We get a new cohort of research students that we recruit from primarily College of Engineering. And we have to train them on the techniques that they're going to be using before they go over to Madrid. And we have to get them um, acclimated to what they might be expecting in terms of different cultural differences, um, different uh, climate changes, different food that they'll be uh, exposed to and different ways of attacking things and, and addressing things. And so what I mean by unexpected teams, yeah, they fit under the category of their students, undergrad students, and they're um, mostly engineers, but we don't know exactly who they're going to be every year. And sometimes this can drag along quite a bit all the way up until late in the spring before we know exactly who's going on the study abroad programs and who's going on the research programs. So it takes a lot of preparation to do that, to get people prepared for this. And that's up here, we said we benefit greatly when our students have positive experiences internationally, can truly change their life and outlooks on their career activities. And there's many examples that I could, uh, don't have time to go into, but one student said that he'd never been out of Michigan before. And this is, that means never been out of Michigan, not to Canada, not to Ohio or anything. And he went to Madrid and it changed his life. He, said that he will never be the same again. He really loved it and 
That's one of the statements that we had. Uh, another student, they changed their minds about what they want to do in their career because they want now to go into grad school because of the research opportunity that they had in the experience in Madrid. And they want to collaborate with Madrid and go back there to work with that group again during their PhD studies. So um, that's a, these are really big benefits for the students to be able to see things firsthand and to, for the online intercultural dialogue, it's a major benefit for the um, the person who's experiencing this. And the last thing, it can vault the students and faculty to having more success in writing grants, uh, papers, making research discoveries, receiving awards, and being the seeds for more innovative ideas. And open them up to different opportunities that they wouldn't have had if they didn't have that experience. So they're enhancing their resume, but they're also really um, opening their ideas up so that they can um, innovate from what they've learned in their experience. Okay, the uh, next question was what may be missed when international partnerships are entered into without thoughtful considerations of potential impacts and opportunities with collaborators? Well, what I believe is future research collaborations can be missed out when thoughtful consideration is not involved. This can also lead to misunderstandings and miscommunications, and therefore cutting off ties between faculty and students in the institutions. And sometimes the current work can also be affected and therefore have to stop. So luckily, um, we have not had this happen to us. Um, we've, we've learned uh, some things not to do or some things that didn't work out, just like in research that we try things that don't work out. But we always have been prepared for different things to happen. When I was over in uh, on a sabbatical in Madrid from 2019 to 2020, and we all know what happened during that time, President Trump ordered everybody to come back in March and we did not go back in March. We stayed there, my wife and my child that were there all the way through to the end of August in 2020. And we tried to maintain the ties that we had with our partners in Madrid um, even though it was a difficult time to go through the COVID um, experience there where they shut down much more than they shut down right here. You can imagine it was a big city and they didn't want to spread the COVID. So um, we <clears throat> were prepared enough to stay there to keep our partnerships alive. And I think that since we've come through this pandemic, we've been actually um, stronger and building up now with the number of students that are coming there. How can we apply an engaged global lens to perhaps mundane but important administrative realities of partnership development. Steve talked about this. So I have two comments. It takes a lot of work to put together a sustainable relationship between institutions and different cultures. Uh, we need resources and time and organization and preparation. Student, faculty, research, and recruitment is really important and an involved endeavor. One thing that we don't want to do is get somebody who's not going to be comfortable to be participating overseas um, and we want to, it's hard to weed out sometimes that that's the case. We've had the last group that we had for our study abroad program, we had 12 students that were the best group ever. It's our 12th time over there. And the one before that might have been the least um, involved group, the ones who are more hesitant to um, interact internationally. But we made it through it and they still had a good time. So we want to make sure that we can put the work together to make sure that we can identify what's gonna work and what's not and to help our students out. When success is reached by satisfying the students' needs and perhaps publishing a research paper or receiving uh, an award or grant, this can make it all worth it, not to mention the feeling of having a wonderful experience in a different culture and also making lifelong friends in such cultures. So uh, that's what we can look forward to as we go through this program. I only have about two more minutes, but I want to address the last question. Um, it was uh, rollicked in a pandemic that at times seemed to be threatened some international institution partnerships, but we adjust our thinking about these collaborations to prioritize sustainable and ensured alignment with long-term goals. Yes, we need to consider this. And we were able to pull through the pandemic and we're starting to pick up even more than we had before the pandemic uh, with student uh, participating in these programs now. And so it's really bending up momentum. And one of the best recruitment tools for future students is the students themselves. When we go to our meetings or other information meetings, the students from previous years go to them 
And they can believe the students more than they will believe the teachers or the leaders of the programs because the students are the ones they, um, uh, they um, are recognizing the most, that they can relate to the most is what I'm looking for. And so they believe that they can have the same experience that these other students did. All right, I'm going to stop this, uh, put that one down. I know I only have one more minute left. And one of the things that's really important that we found for respecting other institutions and finding out how to improve is assessments. We have an assessment person that we pay for our NSF grant to assess the students and their research. And there's some things to highlight here um, that I'm running out of time, but there's an important aspect for this that they respect each other when they um, are working with the, the potential collaborators that they have and their mentors that they have. And this document that I could send to anybody who wants to is from an outside of Michigan State assessment person who talks to the students before and after they come back from Madrid and they identify what the issues are that they had problems with and what the strengths were. And one of the things was that in the working place, the research environment, they both respected each other. And that was one of the things that was highlighted in this um, particular uh, report that I submit to NSF each year for our um, uh, pr uh, program. And then we would address anything that was a weakness in that program going from year to year. And so I think it's something important and therefore you have to strive to show that respect because that's what the students are really looking for. So with that, I think I've gone over time. I will try to stop my share and let the next speaker speak. Thank you, Carl, very much. Okay, next up we have Julie Sinclair. Julie, I will turn it up over All to right. you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Opal, for the invitation. And Stephen and Carl, it was great to hear from you. And I hope that some of my con comments will build on what you've shared already. So again, I'm Julie and I'm in the Office of International Studies in Education in the College of Education. And I will say that what I'm sharing is, is from the perspective of being a US-based administrator. So I'm a career administrator. I've been working in international higher education for almost 30 years in various roles, supporting international students and scholars and other things. And I'm now in the College of Education. And so uh, when I looked at your questions, it just raised more questions for me. You know, once we answer one question, Question, other questions pop up. And this is partly framed by the role I've had over many years, which is how can we include more people in these partnerships? If we're going to have sustainable partnerships, um, we need to involve more than curr are currently involved. And I don't just mean people who already have interests in global work. I mean, people who don't. And you know, how, how are we going to get others involved who might never have thought about being part of uh, globally focused partnerships. How can we then better identify and reduce barriers to allow and encourage more involvement? And how can we think more creatively about additional ways to build and support more meaningful partnerships? So when I read your questions, these were my questions. So I'm gonna frame my conversation around, around this. So in our College of Education, we have built some what we call living principles, and I give credit to this uh, to Lynn Page. I think she's joining us today, who's the Associate Dean of International Studies here, and in having conversations with our dean a few years ago, came up with, this is how we, we hope we're thinking about international partnerships and the global work that we do. And so these are some of the principles, and you've heard some of this already shared by Steve and Carl. Um, so we rethink this all the time. And that's why I've said living. It's always something to rethink and revisit. Uh, but these are some as they exist right now and connected to the college, strategic, connecting to our, our main areas and strengths and interests, uh, helping to build additional connections at multiple levels. So I'm a student of um, organizations, I would say, in, in my background in uh, my PhD in higher education, I developed a real interest in understanding organizations, how they work, how they frame the way they work, and how the different levels of an organization can hinder or support the different kinds of work we do. So again, these are living principles, but things that we try to operate on, we share with 
our students, our faculty, with international colleagues who, who are here and come to join us so that they have a sense of what does this mean for us. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of projects I've been involved in. And one was a, a video research project, I'll call it, that was really a creation of a series of videos about how faculty become involved in international partnerships and collaborations. And it started out as a, a learning tool to support some professional learning programs that we were offering, but it really became about understanding why faculty do or don't get involved, what are the values they 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 hold that help them to get involved, what are things that are difficult in getting involved. And also it comes from years of travel um, to different places and meeting with partners and how the expectations are so different. In some places, for example, the university president might hope that we would match up our faculty with their faculty. And of course, things are a little bit more bottom up here. So how do you work with all of these different kinds of expectations? And these are some of the challenges faculty shared. There's plenty of literature out there in the US context anyway on faculty engagement in international work. So probably none of this is surprising. But what I hope to find was a little bit deeper understanding of some of the barriers again, and that comes partly from my role of supporting partnerships in the college. So these are some of the things, and you've heard about a little bit of that already. And these were strategies that the faculty shared in strengthening international collaborations and partnerships. And again, you've heard some of these, taking a, a long-term view, developing relationships, focusing on mutual and benefit. And the thing I wanted to illustrate here is um, a project that one of our faculty members was working on with 12 university partners in Kazakhstan. And they took time to figure out their shared goals and values. And I think this is really important. And they used a flower that grows in Kazakhstan called the Scylla flower to represent the project. And they used it because uh, they had colleagues speaking three different languages, Kazakh, Russian, and English. But Scylla flower, it's the same word in all three languages. And it represents sustainability, new growth, and other things like that. So they they framed their project with this symbol in mind. And I thought that was a really interesting way to create some shared meaning when collaborating with partners in other countries who are speaking different languages. Another theme that I think really stands out to me, and we've heard about this as well, is collaboration starts at home. I think that is incredibly important. Our own processes, our own layers of many different units, colleges, disciplines, we all have different expectations and priorities. And I think a key to building a good partnership before we can even work with colleagues not at MSU is, is collaborating well here. Also creating that idea of curiosity and co-learning. So these were some of the ways faculty were able to uh, strengthen international collaborations. And again, these are all US-based faculty. So this is not considering the faculty they were working with in, in other countries. Another project that has helped me as an administrator to understand um, working with others, involving others, is, is I got to be a Lilly Fellow a couple of years ago during the pandemic. And as part of that, you create a project. So the project I created was a doctoral fellowship. And part of what I see is that when we're preparing students not only to be involved in international partnerships, but they may lead them someday. They are going to be our future faculty researchers, administrators. And I, I haven't seen that the curriculum that we offer helps them learn how to do these and understand you know, good principles in working on international partnerships and collaborations. And so the fellowship involved five doctoral students in the College of Education, and they were from four different programs in five different countries. And together we looked at these topics. So there were some topics I had in mind and there were others that came out of brainstorming with them on what could we, what could help their learning. And one was a lot of them had thought about having a research partner outside of the US, but they hadn't realized the wide range of possibilities of partnerships that exist in the higher education world. So we talked about all different kinds of collaborations that they might possibly encounter or wanna learn about. We talked about how faculty become engaged and what are the barriers. We actually used the video series that I talked about earlier as part of the curriculum in this fellowship. 
and they're for each of them decided to do a video as their project and they chose to interview non-US based faculty. So to begin gaining understanding outside of our own context. I've said this before, collaboration starts at home. We had a whole session on that. It was quite a shock to these students how many processes, procedures, offices, and things are involved. Uh, and, and it wasn't something they had a lot of understanding with, about. And it also allowed them to connect with other offices. We had speakers come from different offices and units and uh, grew their awareness of those resources on campus. We talked about ethics in international partnerships. We had colleagues from the Alliance for African Partnership and African Studies join us for a discussion on decolonization in partnerships and looking specifically at the global south. A topic they wanted was learning from failure. What happens when a partnership fails and what are the lessons that can be learned? And, and again, how do you actually build a collaboration of different types? What are the pieces? How do you think about that? So, you know, to me, it's really important that we bring others along and that we take the opportunity to help our students not only be involved in these things, but learn about how they work. So just one example project that I wanted to speak a little bit about in light of those things was one that we're just coming to the end of, and this has been a collaboration between the College of Education and VIPP, which is the Visiting International Professional Program at MSU. It was a two-year program called Enhancing um, female leadership in higher education. And we worked with a hundred women in two different cohorts over two years. Much of it was virtual. One of the cohorts was here for, for a few weeks and we just are a few weeks back from a final summit in Pakistan. And not only has it been something where we could involve a lot of different people, for example, many different offices at MSU, several outside organizations that focus on women's leadership and now building connections with many different institutions in, in Pakistan, which we're seeing are going to lead to some really creative and interesting partnerships in the future. Um, but it was an example to me of collaboration starts at home in a good way. We met every other week, our project team. Uh, we talked through all the challenges and hurdles of which there were many <laughs> along the way. Um, having to take, take a sudden shift in many different regards. And so, again, if, if we can work more effectively across our own organizational layers and units, we have a much better chance of understanding and supporting um, at, um, a more equitable, sustainable partnership with collaborators and institutions outside of MSU. Uh, so that is brings me pretty much to the end here, um, but I'm more than happy again to answer questions. I think I'm ending a few minutes early actually. So it'll give us a little bit more time to have questions. So I'll turn it back to you, Opal. Okay, thank you, Julie. So thank you to all of our presenters. Very, um, very different presentations, but um, obviously some core themes that are resonating throughout. Um, so I'll open it up now. Um, to our audience to ask if there are any questions. So feel free to raise your hand or place your question in the chat or unmute yourself. So I think we have one from Alexandra. It's a question for um, Steve. In your experience, which of the principles that you mentioned did you see MSU or higher education institutions in general excelling at? And which principles should we be especially careful to pay attention to because they were too often not prioritized or misunderstood? Well, wow, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to pass this exam. Um, you know, I said I was a philosopher. The other hat I've been wearing is an administrator. So I'm going to uh, sort of look at the uh, at that last set of three three things that I thought uh, as an administrator were important and give you a sense of how I think we do. Um, I think the, the healthcare issue is a tough one in, uh, in countries, whether it's India or Mali, uh, there are just a lot of healthcare risks. I think our travel clinic is great, though I think it's had some hiccups in the last year or two. I think it's back on its feet, but um, the inequality in healthcare means that there are 
ways in which the your programs get interrupted uh, quite often because of illnesses. I've had many partners who were gone. You know, I got to Mali and they were back out of commission because of malaria. Doesn't go away, it comes back. Uh, so there are ways in which uh, healthcare, you know, is just a an unavoidable problem. And I don't know that we could do better, but it it's a very it's a very big issue, especially for students, study abroad students. I've had students who didn't take their meds. And I've had students who were on my study abroad program and I didn't know that they had mental health issues because it was not uh, permissible for me to know about that before they got there. I had a student who came to me in the first day of a study abroad program and said, here's my EpiPen. If it looks like I'm about to die, uh, use it. And I had never used an EpiPen on another person. So the kind of healthcare training for faculty uh, who are working abroad, I think is really important. That's where I would like to see us do better uh, in terms of the principles. Uh, I don't wanna eat up too much time. Um, local customs, I think you just have to learn the language. You have to know how people are reacting to you. You know, Carl and, and Julie both emphasize that. You, you have to have a good feel for the local customs and preparing students who go on study abroad so that they have that same understanding of local customs is really important. Uh, it's hard to do given students time and, and availability before you, you go on a study abroad program, but that, that could be done better. Thanks, Steve. Carl and Julie, I wonder if you had any additional thoughts and maybe specifically um, thinking about those areas where you think MSU is, is doing a better job um, or specific principles that can we also comment on ones that we need to work on. Julie, would you like to go first? Well, um, I think <laughs> I, what I, I do hear a lot of respect for the idea of, you know, mutual learning and mutual shared, you know, the idea of we're no longer just going over there and imparting knowledge and all of this. We're, we're past that at MSU, I think. And, and that's a really good thing. It's really, I think we need to know a lot more still, at least I do about uh, expectations and how to understand the perspective of those that aren't at MSU. I think in many cases we could still do better at MSU on our own collaboration and building effective, um, yeah, being more effective in our own work, collaborating across disciplines. You know, I think we come to this as units or disciplines with different expectations, different ways of um, understanding what this work means. And it might not hurt us in the very early stages to sit down and think about what our colleague did in, with his colleagues in Kazakhstan as what do we see as a shared value we could rally around? What's some kind of a symbol that describes what this is that keeps meaning going even when all of the bureaucracy and things like that sort of weighs us down? So that's one thought I would have. Carl? Yeah, I would can't I don't think I have too much more to add than anybody else. Um we wanna I don't know exactly what is misunderstood or you know what the definite weaknesses for MSU are, but I think that communication is one of the biggest things that we can uh, continue to be open about and talk through any of uh, problems or anything that um, would discourage a, a partnership and be open to it. Hey, listen, let's take this situation and let's talk about if this would happen or if this would happen and be open to anything that would come up and talk through as much as we could predict the bad things that could happen and say this is what we want to do and be very open and honest because there's limited resources on either of the parts of in, any institution, limited times. And we want to be as efficient as possible. So I think work with those constraints and communicate the best you can. It's hard to communicate because sometimes your six or 10 hours difference as well. Just to get time to talk with your partners is one thing. Thank you. We have another question, which is, how can we help faculty have a realistic sense of the demands of leading, organizing partnership work? 
without discouraging them or having them surprised and perhaps resentful of the demands. Some have wondered how faculty are vetted for this work or if there should be some process. Any thoughts you'd like to share on that? Well, I think that sometimes when I'm when you're in the tenure track system and you have all these demands of your time to achieve what the mission is of your um, assignments, whether it's teaching or research or service, um, sometimes efforts internationally are not as highly prioritized in that tenure track process for achieving your goals. And so that's a, each faculty has to be realistic about what their demands are and what will happen with this partnership going forward. And so they don't always work out and you could lose some time that you were planning to have work out. Luckily I've had some success in them and it's built up to the point where it was amazing where I'd be able to get NSF grants for my partnerships, which helps with the tenure process and helps out when I'm really interested in establishing collaborations and doing research and getting students to perform the research and having them successful. So um, there's a risk involved. Um, I wouldn't discourage any faculty from getting involved in doing this, even though there's some risks involved into that. Um, but uh, <clears throat> There may not be, and there there are many, many benefits that we've been talking about. Um, they're not guaranteed. Just like when you write a grant, it takes a lot of time to write a grant to get the fruits from it back. Um, but the summer study abroad program, there may not be much benefit in terms of what I, uh, the <clears throat> for my tenure system or anything for uh, for doing that. But I think that it led into other things that have been really beneficial for my career. So everybody has to kind of look at that with respect to their career goals as well. I, I think the point. cost it is really important. Uh, and just to sort of reinforce the uh, the research side of it, um, in the last few years, I've been able to co-author some papers with partners in other countries. And that's made my applications for external funding more competitive because they're looking now when you're talking about international sort of research they're looking for not a msu led program but a program that's co-led by your partners in other countries and having somebody who's co-authored an article or a paper with you makes your application i think stronger and gives them a you know a boost in terms of their own uh, careers. So I, I think that uh, that kind of collaboration is is not just uh, a cost to you. I think there's a benefit as well. Absolutely. Great points. There's a question for Julie about um, finding out more about the video research projects that she mentioned and where they were um, available publicly. And the answer is that they're not yet posted or written about, that they're hoping to do that. And Julie um, invites uh, inquiries about that. Um, we may just have time for one more question. We'll see how this goes. Um, but this one is for Stephen Carl. Could you talk a bit about the beginning of your initiatives, um, how you became involved, how they started, what kinds of conversations were needed to get them established with the last sort of three minutes that we have? Do you have some thoughts on that? I have a quick answer and then Carl can have the more of the time. Uh, a, a colleague in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources was working in West Africa. He asked me as a philosopher to join a project on GMO foods, and uh, that got my appetite, uh, whetted my appetite, and I haven't been able to stay away from Molly since. Okay, I can uh, go to the next part. So two things that the college engineering was offering if anybody wanted to help participate in this joint effort with the IID Madras, and they were willing to um, put up the travel costs for that. And I was open to that because I know it was one of the best metallurgical institutes in um, India. So I really wanted to do that. And there was not much of a risk other than going there and um, taking some time to meet people that I didn't know. And so that was how we started that initiative. And it's worked out really well because we identified a student to be a PH joint PhD program. So the other one with Madrid, it happens that my wife is from Madrid. 
<laughs> so I would be visiting Madrid regardless. And I knew I had a colleague before that I had met during my PhD studies who was from Madrid. And so naturally I went out, reached out to him. I say, listen, can we collaborate? And he was starting this institute that I talked about, the MDEA Materials Institute. And he said, yeah, we can write a proposal to get a sabbatical in Madrid, which of course was of interest to my family because my wife was very interested in um, living there for a year next to be with her family as well. And so that's how it's really started initiating and really started to grow and pick up. But since then, we've gotten several other faculty involved who have gone over there with fellow, with um, uh, grants to travel there um, and do research there and be involved in these study abroad programs and the research programs. And so it's just kind of built up from that. So that's how I got involved in both those ones. Great. And then Lynn has Lynn Payne has put some uh, comments in here about multi faceted relationships and how important that is. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to take a look in the chat. Really important conversation, as many people have noted um, in their comments as well. Dr. Esquith, Dr. Bullard, and Dr. Sinclair, I want to thank you so much for sharing your time with us, for taking the time to prepare your presentations, for reflecting on these important journeys. Um, the personal experiences you've shared, the challenges and the opportunities, and for giving us so much to think about. Happy International Education Week to everyone, and thank you again for joining us.